I want to start off by maybe asking, going back to the very start and asking how you how you kind of came about, how Space Popular began. Was it something that emerged from university or did you work in practice first and then transition into this? What's your, your kind of background story? We both uh, studied at BAA, uh, graduated the same year. Um, however, we didn't start really working together until uh, like about a year. Well, we, we, we moved right after uh, graduating. We moved to Bangkok where we got a teaching job at uh, mm -hmm. INDA uh, in Chilalongkorn University. And uh, after uh, about a year and a half of, of learning how to teach, <laughs> we, we then decided to start doing projects together. Um, and then we basically founded the office and started doing competitions together. Yeah, so we were based for, the office was based in Bangkok for about five years where we did uh, a few, we did interiors and furniture apart from teaching and basically we were both year coordinators at the school that Lara was just mentioning. So there was um, a lot, a lot of explorations with our interests with the students mm. and a lot of competitions. And then we, uh, after Bangkok, we uh, located back to, to London where we've been based now for almost four years, mm -hmm. where we're again teaching at the AA, at the Architect Architectural Association and um, run the office from here. But the, the work is, uh, projects that we do are all over the world, um, not necessarily in the UK or even in Europe. Mm -hmm. And one of the most striking things, I think, kind of doing research into this was the sheer variety of work that you do, um, you know, from architecture to furniture to, to exhibitions. And you, you mentioned there when you, when you set up the practice, uh, this seemed to be something which was there from the start, am I right? Where you were, you, you, ha you had all these, mul you had multiple explorations, you didn't kind of focus in on one thing. Was that, uh, was that, was that an intentional thing that any, that maybe you thought as starting up that uh, this would give you the biggest breadth of opportunity or has this always been simply how you evolved as architects where you were just multidisciplinary from the beginning? Well, I think coming back again from, you know, where usually things starts for a, a young creative. The, the Architectural Association kind of helps you set up a very multidisciplinary thinking of the world and what you're capable of. And then, I mean, it's in our logo. Uh, if you look closely, it says all things, all places. We kind of were very mm -hmm. interested in applying the kind of um, skills we maybe have and the interests we have to as many areas as possible both because we really <clears throat> enjoy um, a wide range of different challenges, everything from you know scavenging around side streets in Bangkok looking for the perfect material for a chair to designing a, an enormous housing project or, or doing immersive cinema. And we've been just really lucky that apart from projects we've self-initiated, we've, we've uh, had a chance with a wide range of clients and uh, both you know, museums and, and the private clients to continue to be multidisciplinary and, and hopefully without, you know, losing something along the way, but rather just, you know, with each thing we try getting better, better at it now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how does that, how does that translate into your everyday work? Um, so you, you talked about going from large housing schemes to pieces of furniture. Is this something that would happen all in one day or do you find it almost a bit of a, a relief to kind of move away from the large house to the, to the chair and then back to the large house again is it how, how do you how do you balance that okay yeah yeah it happens all in one day <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> um i don't know i think indian is not so different to be like especially when you are in the in the area of detailing and materials and so on in the end you end up doing drawings that are very similar so you start finding that you apply relatively similar principles to one and the other and maybe it makes you think about the detailing of the structure for a building with the same freedom uh, as you think about the detailing for the structure mm. of, of a piece of furniture. Um, so I think that is uh, that is something to keep in mind that, that in the end uh, you might be applying the same logic and the same approach to wildly different scales because the the, the the thing that critically changes in between when you move between scale like sizes of projects um is basically the degree of collaboration with mm. others 
and even that you also learn working at any scale and and that for example like learning how to better ways to work with other people both like in very practical terms like literally how do we develop methods uh, to work together to also like how to communicate how to say things what to expect from others and uh, how to dialogue is something that also is uh, runs across uh, academia and practice which uh, that was a, a wonderful uh, learning experience uh, when going into teaching right after graduating and also mm. the, the, quite a bit of coordination that we did in our teaching in Bangkok was uh, really incredible to just learn really how to work with, uh, with, with a team of people that are often most of them more qualified or with more experience than yourself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but there's also, I think, interesting to add to that is that the kind of practice that we run I think is very, very common in the last 10 to 15 years maybe, but before then I don't think you would really see the kind of office that we run where yeah. our collaborators are based where the projects are by and large. Um, we we range from up to a few people to really the core of the office is, is uh, just the two directors. And then, you know, we have, you know, when we have projects on site, we're, we're literally, you know, about two or three hours a day on a various amount of virtual platforms, everything from simple things like chatting or, or uh, video calls and things like this. And it might not be ideal, but we managed to, to then have projects on site in different continents simultaneously, uh, thanks to the current, I mean, the way that media has evolved, basically. So. Mm. Yeah, I've actually, because virtual reality and virtual ways of thinking is so prevalent in your work that I want to, uh, get onto that in a second. Um, I think, Larry, you mentioned something interesting there about um, your your connection between practice and education and what you learned from education. Um, so how, how important was that experience of education? And do you think that you would have, do you think you would have continued on this trajectory had you not had that experience in education? Do you think it would be something totally different? And do you see that that connection with education as continuing to be important as you as you progress, as the practice evolves? Yeah, it's uh, crucial. It, nothing would have been the same if we didn't begin teaching. I never thought that's what that was the first thing I would do right after uh, finishing school. And, and I feel just so incredibly privileged to to have been able to do that because you quickly and almost without a, without a choice, <laughs> like you quickly like adjust to coming from being able to focus on one project for mm -hmm. a year, well, that's the format we had or for a semester or so, to deal with like 12 to 24 projects um, at simultaneously. And that overview and the agility that, that you develop in like, okay, what is really important for this project? How can we develop a, a, a design method uh, not necessarily resolve it right now, but make sure that I can keep you busy for, for four, six, 12 months. Mm. It's, um, it's something that then uh, like in, you take that in with yourself to practice. And therefore you start thinking of projects. I, I mean, firstly, like being able to switch between projects quite, uh, not seamlessly, but uh, without much of an much, much of an effort, um, and also like being able to not get uh, locked into one, and mm. uh, be, be able to like have those processes in place. Also to work as as two without having to split projects uh, means that you need to also really get very good at conversation and yeah. uh, how do you express your opinions which is the same as with teaching luckily we are at a time now we all know about the past when the professors used to say really mean things to students and now of course thank god it's not like that at all and uh, the way you communicate critique the way you express an opinion even though the way you form an, even the way you form an opinion mm -hmm. um you become a lot more careful with that and a lot better at that so i think without teaching i mean of course all of the ideas that we developed but also the the, the ways uh, of expressing the ways of dialoguing uh would not be there and i think mm -hmm. i did much harder mm -hmm. um frederick do you have anything to 
anything further? It's quite comprehensive, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no I, I just maybe add that, of course, also both uh, teaching and having, you know, studied ourselves in very, uh, in very creative and interesting settings allows you to keep a very broad view on the world, um, mm -hmm. which I think... Um, I mean, this probably applies whenever you happen to live, but you could say that it's maybe more important than ever, um, which you probably could say in the 60s and the 19th century as well. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, both helping students to find their way with ideas that might not necessarily be the most obvious thing to do, uh, both on a very personal and almost selfish level, of course, sharpens your your neurons in a way that just nothing else could but and also every now and then something that you develop i mean obviously the things that we develop with students the student projects we think are completely and utter relevant of course but eventually they they do become incredibly relevant and uh, i mean now for instance with our students at the architectural association uh, in our diploma unit called the civic program we're dealing with uh, questions of civic space uh, in virtual environments, for instance, um, which, you know, is not talked about much, but it's something that we definitely foresee that we will really have to deal with in our practice. And as just uh, everyone in the world will have to deal with those questions much more in the next, uh, let's say, 20 to 30 years. Um, but it allows us to really spend time and talking about them and exploring them. Mm. Uh, in terms of virtual processes, then, obviously, th throughout the course of the last few weeks, uh, architects all over the world have almost overnight been forced to place virtual and um, digital practices at the core of what they do because offices have been shut down, people are working remotely. And I'm wondering, how have you, as a practice, have you had to change anything over the last few weeks or... Have you ha, has your 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 attention to virtual and digital technologies uh, allowed you to, to to not have to change much in your everyday in your everyday work? I mean, I think a lot has changed for us. Uh, a few projects are delayed and things like that. Like for everybody, a bit of a rough time when you are at a very nuclear, very small um, office. Mm -hmm. uh, so more in terms of planning, things have changed. In terms of um, working, <laughs> the situation is that like the co the core of the office, or like the office itself, uh, remains physically in the same space, right? I think the the big changes uh, would be if uh, or comparable to the changes that other people uh, with bigger offices are having, would be if we ended up in uh, <laughs> different corners of the world, and that would probably have been um, uh, a, a bit of a challenge because uh, we're very used to working remotely with others. We're not used to working remotely in mm. between the two of us. Um, so in that sense, uh, it's almost uh, unnoticeable, the the day-to-day the -day, um, work for us. However, the considerations of the type of work that we might be able to develop now uh, mm. are could be quite significant what, what we could uh, start doing now, now mainly not just because of how things have changed for us but because of how the view of uh, the possibilities with virtual spaces might uh, change others and uh, we're of course like rushing to think about like what's what are the formats um, or the type of spaces that um, that uh, people might be needing very immediately because usually we think about the projects we are doing look at a moment in about five to ten years time with different types of um, hardware basically most of the projects that we do with regards to the virtual speculate on a near future situation mm -hmm. um but this has pushed us to think about the right now yeah and which solutions uh, can we provide uh, to different people with different needs with their current means and with that i mean their uh, types of the, the type of hardware that they have now. Which... Yeah, but of course, um, the one one big shift is that the spaces that we usually spend quite a lot of time in is uh, social VR places that um, have been a part of our exhibition work 
um, for the past couple of years. For instance, in the in our exhibition value in the virtual uh, with curator James Hiller Foster at Arctis, there was a, a a headset in the middle of the exhibition where visitors could could uh, tune in to a a shared virtual environment where we would then join from our studio here. People, anyone from in the, from the world could join. And those spaces have been more or less occupied in the last, uh, since we've been spending time there the last three years or so, but they're now in the last couple of weeks, very busy. But so, so we, we still meet up with our friends uh, and uh, collaborators from all over the world through our avatars. And of course, every time we go in literally day by day, they're more and more crowded and there's more and more people more and more newcomers, which is also very interesting because literally you're meeting someone wearing their avatar for the first time and you you get the chance to kind of invite people to this. Despite this situation, we don't think that this necessarily, um, of course, just something that's going to happen now and then disappear or, or be there just because we may not be able to travel in the future as much as we can, but because the intrinsic quality in those spaces themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so, so. Of course, we are, you know, where we are always, we're completely you know, kitted out with, with the hardware so that we can join any virtual meeting with a conference that's going on actually just these days um, where we're joining, joining through our headsets. Mm. It has been fascinating uh, over the last, even over the last few days, watching how ideas, even beyond architecture, ideas that used to be considered fringe ideas like universal basic income, um, have almost overnight become government policies yeah. even in, in the UK or the US and architecture and real estate and construction have often been accused of being slow to adapt to change or slow to evolve. Do you think that the, the, the kind of shock factor that we've, uh, that we've got now where um, architects and designers have almost been forced to to embrace these new virtual technologies do you think that do you think that will last beyond uh, beyond this outbreak do you think things will go back to normal or do you how do you how do you see the future of of these virtual systems um, kind of unfolding uh, in the industry in the future we no, go ahead we have been talking about it, um, like before uh, all of this unraveled we were talking about the, the fact that the way in which the virtual was uh, virtual spaces were going to become mainstream was going to be um, once they were adopted through work for work. Mm. Uh, so in the work environment, I think uh, I mean most people is trying out mostly just like still uh, working with two D interfaces, but uh, some people is venturing into three dimensional virtual worlds, and uh, depending on the duration of this. Uh, it might be more and more and people will get more and more curious. So uh, despite the fact that it might begin as something remedial to, uh, to a tragic situation, uh, I think if it, once it is adopted uh, and uh, explored and people get accustomed to it through work, then it will quickly seep into all areas mm -hmm. of, of life very seamlessly and without us noticing like it happened with the computer, the personal computer, and the phone, etc. So um, then um, that is about like society at large um, adopting uh, that new technology and realizing what it is good for, and also realizing that it does not replace anything. It just adds a new mm -hmm. layer on top. And maybe it replaces some very unnecessary things, but it does not replace our physical uh, interactions at all. Um, and then it will be about whether both the general public and the architectural discipline and identifies uh, those spaces as um, this, uh, as uh, spaces that need to be designed by by architects. Mm -hmm. And I think that cannot be done if uh, architects are not pushing for it, because of course that is a whole world of. Uh, I mean, architects have had uh, their their say in uh, set design, in a little bit in game design, but in, in, in mostly in any discipline that has to do with computing, you mentioned architect and nobody's thinking of an architect like this. They are thinking of the other type of uh, architect. Is a systems, architect, yeah, yeah. systems architect. Um, so I think I, whoever is interested can jump on board as soon as possible. 
And uh, if there is enough architects, then there will be a very interesting discussion around it. And then also like society would recognize that like the importance of, uh, of design within those spaces. Because what is really interesting as well is that in a place where there is no need for shelter, everything you are providing is experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when it comes to question, like as an architect, are we being trained uh, in such a way besides the technical uh, aspect of things are we really uh, trained to think through the way um, spaces uh, have a purpose beyond shelter and it's important also to realize that this current situation should just maybe be mentioned that it's the 23rd of march 2020 just for context mm. um that it might help um or help but it might propel the need for for being together on distance but um, I mean, the situation we find ourselves now technologically is so extreme in how fast it's gone and it has not been propelled by necessarily any direct emergency. It's been propelled by our, by our very, very deep desire need to be as close to each other as we can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, you look at, you know, growing up with the most advanced piece of technology in the home was a VCR and the telephone. Um, within our short lifetime, seeing where we are now, uh, it's driven by other things, not necessarily by by any kind of emergency state. So th this will change things, but the the kind of core of what's driving it is definitely just our deep desire to be as close to each other as possible. Mm -hmm. And has it has it caused you to? to stand back and look at your own practice and the importance of your own practice in a new light. Because when you look at organizations like the MIT Sensible City Lab, they um, are very strong on this idea of using virtual environments and digital environments to kind of propagate, new, propagate new scenarios that might be adopted by the public. And they're one of very few uh, um, institutions or organizations that do that. But looking at your work, you are another um, another practice which seems nimble enough to to uh, to, to very quickly imagine and uh, through your prior no prior knowledge of, of virtual systems to to enact ideas about digital technology and virtual technology. So you you seem to be to a certain extent early adopters of uh, of the idea of, of virtual realities and of digital realities in architecture. So has it, has it caused you to rethink your own importance or your own role as a practice going forward? I think it's it's more just shifted the consideration of when it would happen, really, because mm -hmm. definitely we, I don't think, I mean, we work with these subjects because they just fascinates us to our core, uh, being interested in experience and in the possibility of what's, what space in whichever reality it happens to be in, the possibility it has to gather people. Uh, but of course, like our first exhibitions and our first speculative projects dealing with this, we were talking about a 20 to 30 year timeline of what we as architects, city planners and just general public might have to prepare ourselves for, uh, for good or worse. Um, so it of course changes it in a bit, just in general of just our kind of timeline of when we when we have been thinking about when we would be able to do the projects that we would really, really like to do, that we were thinking like, if we can remain being productive and having fun exploring these topics for the next 20 to 30 years, then we might have a chance to be involved in the creation of something really, really, really kind of fundamental. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, that might happen sooner than we think. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, obviously these things are so immensely complex and there's so many, and it's literally like if you ask someone, Renuel or someone involved in the kind of beginning of the industrial revolution, revolution it's like, are you thinking about the next hundred years? So what, you know, what's this going to do to, to everything? <laughs> and obviously no one is even close to being concerned with all the details, but uh, we're really excited to, to, you know, see it evolve, be it faster or, or slower. Mm. And what what uh, do you think it will change the relationship between arch you, you kind of touched on this before the relationship between architects and the wider public? Um, do you think that these new these new channels will allow us to make architecture more accessible to the public? Do you think that 
moving to a more virtual and digital led approach to design might create feedback loops between architects and the public or do you think there's more opportunities will now emerge for greater collaboration and to bring new people into this to the act of design the act of architecture that normally would have been um, shut out and excluded from it yeah i mean i think just because uh, it will happen at a faster pace no architecture will happen at a faster pace i don't think that the, the um, <laughs> Everyone is always within the, the discipline of architecture, so concerned about uh, oh, not being understood and like well, there being all these conflicts. But I mean, when you look at it, it's like you're designing someone's home to live in the greatest investment of their lives. And most of it is maybe relatively successful, I think. Uh, so I think actually that conversation for how complex the issues you're dealing with and how personal it needs to get. I think it's often actually quite successful despite uh, all of uh, the, <laughs> well, the, uh, how it is often uh, uh, complained uh, about or- Yeah, uh, how we rise it oftenly. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think what uh, the issue is, is that usually with architecture, most uh, people that is involved with it uh, only gets a shot at it or is a developer and then uh, they treat it in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. um, but now uh, with the virtual spaces and potentially doing that in collaboration with architects and so on, it will, uh, people will have so much more access to samples and to seeing like what is, uh, and to maybe samples of uh, places that they develop for themselves for different areas of their work or of their personal lives. Or, and so uh, that communication will get better because we will have more instances, more situations um, mm -hmm. to work with, right? So I think there will be a, a better understanding uh, because of that. I think also the collaboration would now, architects often complain about the people choosing the wrong curtains and things like that. This will, uh, of course, like inflate to unimaginable <laughs> levels. So I think that uh, attachment or, or like understanding your role and what you are delivering will uh, there will be an, a myriad of new uh, possibilities for uh, what the role of an architect would be from like, I think that probably the most relevant would be help with the uh, organization, also with rethinking uh, flow, how you move around spaces, sequence of spaces, uh, and basically like experience design at the core of like, how do you arrive to a place? How do you then come to another room? How are rooms connected, reinvent the door? I mean, it's, uh, the, the, the questions are really exciting and many, and I think that will lead to the range of um, involvement and the level of uh, the, the areas of design for an architect being quite uh, wide. I mean, I think they're already uh, really wide. There's many different types of architects. I think this will just like multiply it by a few times. But of course, this situation an evolving situation like this, of course, on a physical level, of course, can create the sort of escalation of the sort of gated community type of approach to to literature, to physical architecture. Um, mm -hmm. And there's obviously so many layers to this. But if we do focus on on the potential promise of what virtual or semi virtual architecture might be, I mean, the spaces that we spend our time in now uh, that we have been spending our time in uh, in these social VR places and other and other places like that none of them are built by architects um, and that's maybe a good thing uh, they're you know largely they're built by the people that develop the tools to make them themselves but also people of all ages and of all sort of disciplines and certainly the kind of tools that you need to acquire in order to put physical things together to make buildings versus learning how to put virtual spaces together are um, very different and the kind of learning curve is obviously a lot lower um, when it's creating virtual architecture and definitely it will see some kind of process of, of deeper involvement of the general public mm -hmm. in the thinking of space if you just listen to a young person who's interested in in cgi talking about refractions and different kinds of glass and different types of lights and just deep understanding of, of how deep spaces are and, and how to put things together in ways that your average teenager maybe wouldn't be able to do uh, before these tools were available not so long ago. Mm. 
I want to then br bring this back to your your broader work because as we kind of talked about at the start, you you, you work across so many dif disciplines: architecture, exhibitions, interior design, um, virtual realities, um, academia. Is there any mode, any one mode in which you feel most at home and most confident in, or does your kind of underlying philosophy and underlying approach to your work uh, translate equally well across all the different disciplines, regardless of scale or, or purpose or, or digital or physical or, or whatever? Yeah, that's... Uh, I would never think they are different disciplines, though. I mean, because, conventionally, they are seen as being this different disciplines. With, uh, yeah, but the, the, the specialization here that we're aiming towards is... Uh, experience right experience design and that that just just means that it's human centric or like mm -hmm. it's all around how does it work for you as a human i mean that i guess is not even fair to say because like all architects are concerned with that and all furniture designers are concerned with that right so um when you're taking that principle then uh, it uh, they don't they don't become so different from one another, then I guess you get good at certain things and not others. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, it's probably like particular types of buildings with programs uh, that are complex at a level that it would require a type of a specialization that uh, maybe we couldn't have. Um, and then also like, I don't know, particular things in, in other areas like furniture design, which we maybe could not uh, get to, but uh, I think at that, so far for now, they all, all the projects seem to be coherent within that. Yeah. Like basically, how do you design any kind of thing, <laughs> any yeah. kind of bit, an enclosure or a thing within the enclosure that you sit on, or, <laughs> right? And um, how do you design that around uh, a particular intention that can come just simply just from us or from us and from a brief that we're given or from us from a brief and from a really important context that we need to respond to and then just like how do you juggle those things together in the best possible way but it's obviously you know there's, there's arguments for and against specialization versus diversity in one's approach to a series of projects or issues and I, I definitely think that that um, you know, we're not the only ones who, who are kind of uh, taking advantage of the kind of media landscape that we find ourselves in, where we have the capacity to gain vast amounts of knowledge of, mm. of, of basically anything. And I think um, our kind of philosophy, let's say, that I think we share with many is that um, whatever the problem or whatever the situation or the challenge might be, the more you know about other things, the better you'll be at solving that or, or, or kind of getting somewhere with that particular issue. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we have now the, the capacity to learn about such vastly different things um, at, su at our fingertips uh, that it basically just seems in a kind of Marshall McLuhan sense, just that's what we're, the responsibility we have, you know, we have the ability to specialize and, be, and become really incredibly good at a specific thing, but which might add a lot of public benefit. But the fact that we can learn about so many different things, because that's, I think, what all of our work has in common is that it's also at its core an excuse to to learn something uh, mm -hmm. about a specific thing. Um, and, it, and that's really maybe what they all have in common is, is just a great urge to kind of learn as much as possible about a, an interesting complex situation mm -hmm. and the more we learn about one thing that might be about a housing project is definitely going to be a small part about creating an immersive piece of cinema for instance yeah and then to to kind of wrap up then so um you have coming up an exhibition at the or, or iba in london which we're going to talk to you at a, at a later date about um, is there anything else kind of interesting that you're working on that you can share with us or uh, an overview of what 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 interests or what um, what, uh, what what's occupying your your time at the moment uh, I know it's all it's probably all been upended in the last few days but <laughs> no but we were lucky enough to finish a few things that haven't been that are not no, well finished kind of thing that hasn't been uh, published uh, yet which probably will be out soon which is the design for another uh, spa in uh, in Bangkok, Thailand. So mm -hmm. 
with a whole new uh, furniture collection and uh, everything customized again. So we're very excited to be able to share that soon. Sure. Um, and then also we're working uh, on a on a very exciting project uh, that it's almost ready and just got delayed and hopefully will not get delayed anymore. But uh, with um, with the company Finza, uh, mm. which is a company uh, that a Spanish company uh, that makes wood and different types of wood products, and uh, we designed a whole quite monumental display um, for their new uh, range of products, which uh, will be shown at the design museum. Uh, mm -hmm. now in uh, late June, um, so that we are uh, really excited about and that will be shown in London at the same museum only for one day, mm -hmm. so uh, whoever wants to see that should keep an eye out. But more more generally, of course, we in the, the kind of string of exhibitions and speculative projects we've been lucky to develop, we obviously have um, have our minds on the kind of ambition of what we will be able to do in the next five to ten years. Um, as we see probably at least within the next five years, um, the projects that we will hopefully will be able to do will remain more or less in the world of speculation where we we engage the public as we have done in, a, in exhibitions in the past, but in a more ambitious way in what um, a semi or fully virtual experience might be like and what it could mean for, for the human experience and, and the potential of being together in virtual space. So probably in the next couple of years, we'll see uh, larger, more ambitious and more connected uh, uh, projects um, in bigger and bigger spaces. Um, and then hopefully within the next 10 years, as, as we said in the beginning, we'll be able to kind of uh, really kind of get our hands on some, on actually playing a kind of more substantial role in how these things actually might be rolled out to the general public. Um, yeah.